Welcome to our Bible study today. Uh, last week we talked about the woman at the well, and this week we're going to talk about another miracle, a healing that occurred when Jesus confronted the blind man. Uh, now, as we prepare for this lesson, I pray that you'll let the Holy Spirit to guide you, because nothing that I'm going to tell you is going to change anything, but the Holy Spirit, as he works through the words that I say uh, and works through you, that, that's when lives are changed. And uh, you may be a Christian, you may not be. If you are, uh, then I pray that these words will help you be a, a better Christian and help you walk closer to the Lord. If you're not a Christian, I hope that you'll see God's power in the stories and in the miracles that he had, that he performed, and that he can perform a miracle in your life as well. So let's go ahead and, and start with the word of prayer. Uh, Father, thank you for caring for us and for loving us and for healing us. Thank you, Father, for spiritual power that you give us through your spirit. Help us now to connect with your words, to let the Spirit guide us with them, and to change our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, well, if you will, turn with me to John chapter 9. If you don't have a Bible, that's okay. John chapter 9 is uh, where we're going to be reading from. I'll read all the verses to you, so you can get by without having a Bible. But if you uh, if you don't have one for some reason, then would they, they, they can be, as we studied in the Vacation Bible School, a, a lamp to my feet. So it's something that you, you can have. They're not very expensive usually. And in fact, I can get you one for free if you just email me at timbell at windstream.net. Uh, and I'll be glad to uh, get one for you. Uh, and, uh, and then you can have a, a, a light that illuminates uh, Jesus and what he did and many, many other events and situations in the Old and New Testament that will help you to have a good walk with him. Okay, uh, verse 9 of John. Uh, last time we talked about John chapter 4, about the Samaritan woman and how Jesus converted her with his words. Now we're going to see about chap uh, John chapter 9. Now, John wrote this letter probably while he was in prison in Patmos. So this is one of the oldest or newest gospels, I should say, probably written in like 90, around 90. The other ones are written 50, 60 uh, AD, but this one about 90. And uh, John's uh, writing of the gospel was different than the other Matthew, Mark, and Luke because they wrote uh, uh, a lot of their stories were, if they were in one, they were in the, they were in the other, and they uh, had a different approach. Uh, John's approach was um, he was writing to fulfill the spiritual needs of people, and he used spiritual language more than the other three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so it is that as we look at this, we'll see about Jesus Christ revealing himself to this man and him accepting Jesus as his Lord and Savior. He had a lot of stories like this in John. There weren't many in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but in John, uh, he was trying to bring about the power of Jesus and the, the uh, difference he can make in people's lives. So if you turn with me to, to uh, verse 1 of chapter 9, it says, As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? So uh, his um, disciples, they thought that anything, anytime anybody had a, an infirmity or a problem or a difficulty, uh, could be physical or whatever, it's because of sin that they had in their lives. Now, I realize that sin in our lives uh, does cause problems and difficulties. Uh, if you uh, take meth or you take uh, another kind of drug, it could affect your body. It could affect your relationship with other people. Uh, if you have uh, you know, an, an addiction with one thing or another, uh, you may have direct fallout because of that. And you, the sin that you're living in will cause problems and difficulties for you in your life. But not necessarily just because somebody... Uh, something evil happens to somebody. I mean, here was a guy that says that uh, he was blind from birth. So the people assume that his parents sinned, uh, unless he sinned in the womb, but they have assumed maybe it was his parents, you know, which which is ludicrous. But people believe that today. They think that every time something bad happens, it's because of sin in your life or sin in somebody else's life that God is punish, punishing you for that. Now, I, like, I'm say, I, like I say, there are repercussions for sins that we commit, but a lot of things that you that happen in your life, like death and sickness and illness and, and whatever it may be, it is not as a result 
of sin, direct sin that you uh, committed in your life. It's a, it's a result from sin, from worldly sin, and we're a part of that, and it's part of our own nature. So in that sense, it is um, uh, a uh, product of our sinful natures. But, but in general, uh, it's not, people can't look at you and say, well, there's a real wealthy, rich person, and therefore God's really blessed them, which is what the Jews thought. But instead, um, uh, or look at a poor person and say, well, you know, those people there, they're, they must be low lives. They're not doing what it was that God wanted them to do. So they're being punished for that. Uh, or uh, somebody may die a terrible death of cancer or something else. And people may say, well, they died a bad death because they lived a terrible life. Well, no, that's not the way God works. And, and so, so don't, don't think that. And when, when the disciples thought that and asked Jesus about it, he said, neither people have sinned. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus said. But this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the light, in the world, I am the light of the world. So Jesus is saying that this man didn't do anything wrong. His problems and difficulties weren't because of something that he did. Uh, but they, they occurred. And because they occurred, because this individual was in this, in this condition, God said, I, I am going to be able to take this situation and bring glory to my father. Now, I've known people who, uh, well, I had a next door neighbor who was not a Christian and he didn't act like one and he was not looked at very, um, very well by a lot of people in the community, uh, but he got a brain tumor and uh, right before he got the brain tumor, he'd become a Christian and he uh, spent his last days in the hospital and the nursing home telling other people about Jesus Christ. So, so here was a man who, who, um, did not get a brain tumor so that he could tell others about Jesus Christ, but he got a brain tumor. And because he had the brain tumor, God used that to glorify his name by allowing people to come and visit Bill and he could tell them about Jesus Christ. So, so it, you know, they, they all work together, but one is not a result of the other. Um, I've heard people before say, yeah, somebody's son died and, their, and that person became a Christian because of it. So God took his son so he could become a Christian. Well, I, I don't think that. I think that uh, the guy's son died, which was a terrible thing. You know, it's not what God wanted. God doesn't want people to die. Uh, God gave us you know, life from the beginning forever and ever. And then he gave us eternal life. So he didn't want you to die. Uh, but circumstances and problems in life cause death. Uh, but this guy's son, or this this son's father, uh, became a Christian and, and glorified God through this person's death. The, 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 the child didn't die uh, for, the, for the father, but the father, because the child died, the father was able to see Jesus, to see the Holy Spirit uh, in some way through these tragedies and brought him closer to God. Uh, so, so that's what Jesus was telling the people that no, this, this uh, person wasn't born blind because he was evil or his parents were evil. He's born blind so that I can show you uh, through him that I can glorify God. And that's what he did. He used this man, as we'll see in the story, to glorify God. Uh, verse 6, having said this, he spit on the ground and uh, he made some mud with the saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told them. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. So Jesus did what a lot of the doctors at that time did or the medicine people did. They made spit, uh, made mud from spit and, and, uh, and dust. You didn't have to use spit necessarily, but they liked that idea of mud. A lot of, if you see a lot of old uh, cowboy shows, a lot of the uh, uh, Native Americans, they would uh, make mud and put it on wounds on themselves, etc., because they thought that was the way in which to go about doing these things. And that's what they thought in Jesus' day. So Jesus was just using the technique of the day to tie in with the people, I think, to let them know that he was one of them and he understood what was going on. And so he made mud like this and he put it in the guy's eyes. Now, the guy didn't become, um, uh, he, he, uh, he didn't regain his sight immediately. There was still something else that he had to do. And that something else was to be obedient to Jesus. Now, sometimes Jesus would heal somebody and they would, they would take effect right away without them doing any actions. But in this case, he told the man to go wash the mud from his eyes. So here's a guy with mud all in his eyes. And you've got this guy named Jesus who has put the mud in his eyes, who probably wasn't the, 
uh, you know, looked at with a lot of respect because a lot of people rejected Jesus and didn't like what he was saying. Um, and so you had this guy here who's got mud in his eyes and he, he, you know, he supposedly, well, he was blind, but now he supposedly is going to be healed from it if he washes in the pool. Uh, there may people may think, well, I, yeah, this guy's wasting this time. I mean, he's just a fool, and he's making everybody he's, he's making a fool out of himself to everybody that's watching. Um, and yet the guy went. You know, the guy did leave, and he went to do it because he probably thought, what I have to lose, and I have heard about Jesus, and you know, maybe just maybe this will work. It says his neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging, asking, "Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg?" Some claimed that he was. Others said, "No." He only looks like him. Um, and so anyway, he was um, he was on his way to the pool and he washed like Jesus said. So he was obedient to the commands of Christ and he could see his eyes were open. And people, and apparently his whole uh, demeanor changed because some people didn't even recognize him. Uh, How then were your eyes open, they demanded. He replied, the man that they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go wash in the pool of Siloam. So I went and washed and then I could see. Where is this man? They asked him. I don't know, he said. So people are asking him, who did this? And, and uh, you know, the guy went to wash. And, and when he got done, I guess Jesus had left and gone somewhere else. So he didn't know where he was. He said, I don't know. But he said, you know, I was blind, but now I can see. So now the Pharisees, they heard about this, and they don't like Jesus at all. They don't want any miracles or anything else to be um, attributed to, to Jesus and to the work that he does. So they, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was the Sabbath. So the Pharisees are going to turn all this over on the fact that he did this on the Sabbath. I mean, for one thing, you shouldn't heal anybody on the Sabbath. You could uh, treat somebody on the Sabbath and make them not get any worse. But if they got better, then you broke the Sabbath law. So you could maintain a sickness or an illness, keep somebody from dying, but you couldn't make them better on the Sabbath. Well, Jesus did. And the guy could see on the Sabbath. So out of all the things, instead of the Pharisees rejoicing and saying, what kind of power does this man have? Instead, they look at the fact that he, quote, worked on the Sabbath. Um, therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he put, how he had received his uh, sight. And they said, well, he said, uh, they, he put mud in my eyes, the man replied. And then I washed him and now I can see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. I mean, my goodness, you got to keep the Sabbath. The, the Jews, they had all kinds of uh, Sabbatical laws that were based on the, started off with the Ten Commandments on keeping the Lord's Day holy. And they had this uh, volume of books called the Pseudepigrapha, which had uh, told you exactly what you could and could not do, what kind of knots you could tie, uh, the weight of an object that you could lift on the Sabbath, uh, all kinds of rules and laws that were just, uh, you know, ludicrous and totally inappropriate. And 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 but they're turning this into what this guy is saying here. Uh, it says, uh, "This man is not from God." Some of the Pharisees said because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. But others asked, "How can a sinner do such miraculous signs?" So they were divided. So you had the Pharisees splitting up here. Some of them said, "I don't know. I don't see how you can say that this man is not divine. He he worked this miracle. This man can see now." And some said what he did on the Sabbath, and therefore he's a sinner. And so they were divided. Uh, the power of God does that with people, doesn't it? If you become a Christian, you're, you're either accepted by others or you're rejected. Usually, you don't, there's nobody that's just lukewarm, especially if you tell them about Christ. You either upset them or especially if you confront them with their sin, you'll upset them or they won't want anything to do with you or they will. They will follow you, uh, follow Jesus through the words that you get to them and they will become new creatures. Uh, so, so it says finally in verse 17, they turn again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. And so now the guy, all of a sudden, he's at the, he, 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 you know, he's the topic of discussion between the Pharisees. Some of them don't believe that Jesus did what he did, that he was a sinner, that he was not a miracle worker, and others do. So they said, well, just ask this guy. He, that's who got the miracle. Uh, so let's ask him, see what he thinks. And so the guy, he doesn't have any idea. You know, he doesn't know. Just Jesus came along and asked him if he wanted to see and, and made spit and allowed him to wash in the pool, and then he could see. So the man replied, well, uh, he, he's a prophet. 
Well, they didn't like that. And a prophet, the man said he was a prophet because he performed this miracle. Verse 18, the Jews still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. So the Pharisees said, well, this guy's just making this up. He wasn't blind to start with. Let's find out. So they called his parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one you say was born blind? How it is that now he can see? And so the parents, who are afraid of the Pharisees, because they're afraid they may be kicked out of the worship services, out of temple worship, uh, they, they back off uh, or go to the synagogue. They back off because they're more afraid of the Pharisees than they are uh, wanting to stand with their own son and acknowledge the miracle that happened instead of being overjoyed and, you know, and, 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 and you know, totally beside themselves because now their son, who was a beggar, can now see and make a life of his own, uh, it could totally change his life. Um, you know, they, 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 they see their, their options and they don't really want to take a stand for this guy. Who else did that happen to? Yes, Jesus, same thing. We know that he's our son in verse 20, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. So we're, we're telling you this, we know this is the case. But now he can see now, or but how he can see now, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him, you know, let him get himself into trouble. We don't want to be a testimony for him. We don't want to testify on his behalf. It might get us in trouble. We may lose the uh, the opportunity to worship in the synagogue, to listen to the teachers uh, proclaim uh, the, the word of God, etc. We don't want to be ostracized from that community, so let him. Uh, it says, ask, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For already the Jews had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So there's the answer right there, uh, right on the pages of, of the Bible. And so they were afraid. They were afraid to take a stand for their son. Now, a lot of times people will be afraid to take a stand for other Christians. You may, uh, other people are afraid to take a stand for Christ when they're talking about Christ to other people, uh, us included, me included, you included, all of us. Uh, but God doesn't want that to happen. You know, God performed a miracle in your life he came into your life and you became a Christian through him. Uh, and he wants you to share that to other people. And you're going to be rejected sometimes. Uh, sometimes people will listen politely uh, and, you know, at least accept the fact that you're trying and they're not going to be harsh on you. Uh, or some people are going to laugh at you and scorn you and make fun of you. Uh, but some people will actually accept Christ because of the testimony that you give to your life. And that's what uh, it, that's what's going on here. You know, this this guy, he says, I, I don't, I, well, they're, they're, they're going to talk to him again. So let's just, let, let's move on from there. Verse 24, it said, uh, a second time they summoned the, the man who had been blind. Give glory to God. They said, we know this man is a sinner. So they're saying, reject Jesus. Give glory to God. Um, he replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. So the man, the blind man, who's getting ready to be kicked out of the synagogue based on his testimony, he said, I don't know who this man was. I do, I do not know. Was he a sinner? I don't know. He said, but I will tell you one thing. I was blind and now I see. And, and the Pharisees were trying to, some of them were trying to say that this wasn't even a miracle that really even happened. And they were uh, talked to their mother and father to find out if he really was born blind. And the guy said, yeah, I was. I was born blind. I couldn't see. I was having to do things all by myself without anybody in darkness. And I was all alone. He said, so so I don't know who this man is, uh, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. But I do know he worked a miracle in my life, and now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And the man answered, verse 27, uh, I have told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples also? So the man is getting kind of belligerent toward the Pharisees. He's saying, you know, I already told you. What else can I say? Do you want to become his disciples? Do you want to keep hearing the same testimony over and over? Is that why? Because you want to become his disciples? Well, they didn't like that. They hurled insults at him, verse 28. Uh, and, and he says, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses. But as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, now that is remarkable. I mean, this, this guy's really gotten, um, uh, what, what would I say, courage to, to speak his mind and to tell him and to stand up for Christ. 
She says, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to godly man who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. So the guy goes, look, it seems to me like at a just natural logic that if this guy was a sinner, he could not do this miracle. He could not do God's work in healing people if he's a sinner. And therefore, I don't know if he was a sinner or not, but as he talks a little bit more, the guy gets a little bit more courage and he's saying, no, he's not a sinner. If he was, he couldn't have cured me. At 34 says, to this they replied, you are steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. So they threw him out of the synagogue. So here's the guy in one minute receives his physical sight and he, he, he kind of has an inkling on who this spiritual Jesus is and what he can do and how he can help him through his life. And the next minute he's cast out of the synagogue. So he's not able then to worship with the uh, with his Jewish counterparts any longer. Uh, and that's what happens with accepting Jesus sometimes. You know, you get rejected. You know, you're you're not allowed to do, you're not allowed to have the same friends you had before because they think you're kooks or you may not be allowed to go to places that you used to go to before uh, or you don't, you don't want to go to them. And so you get a new uh, pattern of, of uh, friends, etc. And so in verse 35, it says, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the son of man? So here's Jesus finds out the guy was thrown out. And so what does Jesus do? Well, he takes off into the desert and doesn't want to be bothered with him. The guy was blind. He gave him a sight back. He said, that's good enough. I don't really want to be bothered with you anymore. I've got other things to do. And Jesus left. Well, that's really not what happened, was it? Jesus said, well, they're giving this guy a hard time. I need to go talk to him and see what's going on. So Jesus went over to talk to him. And he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? The Son of Man. The guy wouldn't know what the Son of Man was. He says, who is he, sir? Who is the Son of Man? I don't know who he is. And Jesus said, the man asked, tell me so that I may believe in him. And Jesus said, you, may, you, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Remember the woman at the well and Jesus said, uh, I am he. She said, I'm looking for the Messiah. I, I need to ask him some questions. And he said, I'm the Messiah. I, me. And Jesus said to this guy who was trying to figure out who to go talk to about who Jesus was. He said, that's me. I'm the Messiah. I'm standing before you. I'm the one. Uh, he said in verse 37, in fact, you have now seen him. He's the one speaking to you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. So that, that's what the one, Samaritan woman did. She left her water pot and went into town. Well, first she fell down at his feet. And then she accepted him and went into town to tell others. <coughs> so, so verse 39, it says, uh, Jesus said, For judgment I have come into the world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. So Jesus said, I've come into the world so that I can judge the world in the sense that you'll be judged by me, not that I'm going to come and throw thunderbolts on people and kill them and, and destroy their lives, but I have come so that people will see God through me. And when you accept me into your life, that's the judgment. That, that's, you, you cast no judgment on yourself. But if you decide that you don't want anything to do with me, then you have cast judgment on yourself. It's kind of like if you go out and commit a crime, uh, Let's say you go, you go into a store and you steal something and you get caught. Well, you can't say, well, it's the store's fault for having all those products and those items in a shelf that looks so nice and neat. It's their fault. But no, you know, they, they didn't cause judgment on you. You caused judgment because you went in and you broke the law and you stole the things. So when you stand before the judge, you can't say, well, you know, you, you, you can't judge me harshly. It's not my fault. The judge can say, it's, you know, I'm my all I'm doing is letting the law judge you. You know, you're, you're being judged by your actions. I'm not judging you. I'm just carrying out uh, the uh, interpretation of the dis bad decisions that you made. And so uh, Jesus said, For uh, I have come into the world so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. So he's saying, obviously, the Pharisees who think they can see everything, think they know everything, they're so smart, and they know exactly all about God and everything else. Now they're blind. You know, they don't see. And Jesus says, and, and the ones that I came to this world to, to see, uh, well, to, to minister to and to tell them about 
uh, my love and what I want to do for them and to, I want them to follow me. Uh, if they do, their eyes are open. Then they were spiritually blind before that. They didn't know where to look, what to do, who to follow or anything else. But now they see. So he said, so the people who think they know it all don't see anything. And the people who were in darkness trying to figure it out, they do see. And so he said, uh, you know, this paradox is something that Jesus is talking about. Then he says that some, some Pharisees who, who were with him heard him say this and asked, what, are we blind also? And Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. So Jesus was saying basically this, that if you don't know who Jesus was, you know, if you're in darkness, uh, then you have no guilt because you have not been convicted of that. But once I come and once you see who I am and you can make a decision on accepting me or not, then your guilt remains and your eyes have been opened in the sense that you should know the decision that you need to make, but you don't, you didn't make it, and so your eyes are closed, so yes, you are blind. Um, there are people in this world who have opportunities to hear the gospel, and there are some people who don't. And the people who don't... Uh, Hear, hear the gospel. Uh, if they've never been convicted of the Holy Spirit in their lives, uh, then they are living in darkness. Unfortunately, they're living in darkness. Uh, but when Jesus comes or when somebody tells them about the love of Christ, then their eyes are opened and they're no longer blind. They're no longer walking in darkness, but they're walking in the light so they can now see. But other people who have gone to church all their lives and, you know, uh, May, may even be in ministers or priests or whatever, uh, and they go around uh, pointing fingers at other people. And, and, uh, and then all of a sudden, God comes to them through Jesus Christ and convicts them of their sins. They're too haughty and they're too proud. They say, well, I haven't done anything wrong. I don't need to follow Jesus. I can do this on my own. And so the, their, their eyes are not open. They cannot see. Uh, and they were not blind before, at least they don't think they were, they really were, but they don't think they were. And now they're blind because their eyes were opened and they do not re re uh, receive Christ and allow their lives to be changed. So, so the people who think that they're walking in light are really walking in darkness because they do not admit to the fact of who Jesus was and what he can do for them and vice versa. So that's how Jesus ends this uh, section. And it's very interesting, I think, the words that he uses saying that people who, like the blind man, he can see now, and the spiritual people who think they can see, they're blind because they, they saw Christ, they saw what he had to offer, and yet they rejected it. And, and, uh, and, and so it is on this uh, lesson today that Jesus, uh, through John, as John writes all these words down, is very explicit to let us know exactly what Jesus can do and what we should do in response to him. So we need to follow the example of the blind man. And so that's what uh, that's that's my prayer for you today and the prayer for myself that we will follow Jesus like the blind man being blind, realizing that we have received sight and walk with him. Let's close in prayer. Thank you for our time together. We pray, Lord, that you would open our eyes to the spiritual love that you have for us. Thank you for caring about us and just for loving us and for sending your son uh, who gives us insights into our own lives, our darkness and illuminates it and gives us newness in which to walk. I pray, Father, for people who are blind, that they would know the new way in which to walk and how it would make their lives so much better, so much happier, so much joyful, uh, so so much more joyful. Just thank you, Lord, for, for all these miracles that you work through Jesus for us in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.